Welcome everybody to uh, another uh, meeting of the Rocky Mountain Map Society. This time is a recording. Uh, we had our speaker talking in person to all of us, but because technology, we couldn't actually have all of you online participating. But this is a chance that you have to uh, watch a very timely topic, as you will see in a moment, and you will see how the power of maps can help us to understand uh, not just the natural world, but even conflicts uh, among humans here on Earth. So um, what I'm going to do now is uh, pass it uh, on to uh, Naomi Heiser that is going to introduce our speaker and also let you know if there's uh, any other details, but I uh, hope you enjoy this presentation. Thank you. And thank you, Professor Conroy, for being willing to give the talk twice so that we can get a recording. I know that we have many people who have asked to see a version of your talk, and I can't wait to tell everyone it's finally ready. So um, Dr. Mary Schaefer Conroy, she received her PhD in Russian history from Indiana University in 1964, um, went to the USSR for the first time in 63. She took students um, to the USSR in 77 and 1986. She lectured on Viking cruise ships in Russia in 1995, 96, and 97. That sounds pretty interesting. After the archives became open in 1985, she traveled to Russia for research every summer. She taught Russian and Soviet history at Kansas State, the University of Illinois, Chicago, and from 1975 at the University of Colorado, Denver, becoming a full professor in the 1980s and retiring as emeritus professor in 2005. She's the author of many articles and eight books. She has also published works on Russian and Soviet health and French history. Professor Conroy speaks, reads, and writes Russian, and until the Ukrainian conflict, carried on a lively correspondence with colleagues in post-Soviet Russia and Belarus. So expertly taking us through an extensive history, Dr. Conroy will explain to us why do Russians feel different, why do Ukrainians feel different from Russians and wish to be independent. Thank you, Naomi. I'm really honored to give this lecture, this presentation for the Rocky Mountain Map uh, Society. And I hope that it will be enlightening to the people looking at the slides. Thank you. So I, I wish that this talk was on how to solve the Ukrainian crisis. Uh, that would be wonderful. Uh, but, um, as far as we are at, this, at the present, we have no real solution. So I'm going to explain why Ukrainians feel different from Russians and wish to be independent. Um, Naomi already went over my um, background, so I'll skip through these slides. Um, and I, I just want to note that I had three books on the Russian, Russian political system, uh, one translated uh, by a Swedish uh, and Russian, by Swedish and Russian author, uh, three books on healthcare and the medical and the pharmaceutical industry in Imperial and Soviet Russia, and then uh, a kind of fun book on um, uh, E. Virgil Neal, the cosmetics baron you've never heard of, who had his cosmetics firm Tokalone. And how I got into that was because. Um, it, while doing research in the economic archive in Moscow, I found this, this contract between Neil, who wanted to sell pharmaceuticals and um, cosmetics to um, the Soviets in 1924. And the last one is on the collaboration with Germany by Georgians in France during World War II. And the Georgian situation, which we're not going into, is analogous to that in Ukraine because the Georgians declared their independence at the same time, and then they were crushed by the Bolsheviks. They also are independent now, but they have had run-ins with um, Putin and Russia um, recently. I'm going to go into my first book just a little bit more because Stolypin who was a government official in the, the government of Nicholas II, Tsar Nicholas II, was um, assassinated in Kiev while at the opera in September 1911. And he was a law and order man and also a great Russian patriot. 
uh, analogous to uh, President Putin. But unlike uh, Putin, um, Stolypin also was, um, was hopeful that um, democracy would flourish in Russia. He worked with the Third Duma, the lower house of the new parliament in particular, uh, before his assassination. Um, there was some connection with, between Stolypin and Putin, President Putin. <clears throat> um, Stolypin did deal harshly with opponents, uh, particularly in his case, violent revolutionaries. And he was a great Russian patriot pushing Russian culture, but he also was a proponent of democracy. And he worked with the new parliament in Russia that had started in 1906, particularly with the third Duma, the lower house from 1908 until his assassination. He planned agricultural reform and reforms of local government. He eased restrictions on old believers and Jews who were discriminated against, both of them, and promoted the Russian pharmaceutical industry to make it equal to that in Europe. He was persona non grata in 1963, and so it was difficult for me to conduct archival research, but I did do research at the Hoover Library and at the Russian in uh, California, the Hoover and um, the Russian Library in New York at Columbia University. And there were still people alive who knew Stolypin and had worked with him. His cousin, Baron von Meyendorf, who lived in London, and his daughter, Maria von Bach, whom I interviewed extensively, who lived in San Francisco, and Prince Dmitry Obolensky, who had, was a refugee in uh, Stockholm, Sweden. By 1911 and 1912, Stolypin was venerated and I participated in two years of conferences to honor him. Here's his, his picture. He and his family lived in the Winter Palace after a terrorist attack occurred in the summer of 1906 uh, in their Petersburg dacha. And that attack killed 30 people and also injured two of Stolypin's five children very severely. Um, in Kiev in September 2011, one of these conferences took place uh, in, it was the 100th anniversary of his death. And my husband and I are standing with Arkady Stolypin, his great grandson who lived in Paris and came to the conference, but he knew not a word of Russian, sadly. This is Stolypin's grave when I first went to Russia in, or the Soviet Union, I should say, in 1963, Stolypin was buried in the Monastery of the Caves in Kiev, and his grave was asphalted over, as you can see here, because he had suppressed Lenin, Stalin, and other uh, Bolsheviks. But here's the grave in September of 1911, and here is a group of dignitaries, Russian and Ukrainian, uh, at his uh, grave. Arkady, the great grandson, is, is uh, over on our left. We have Pavel Pozhigaila, who subsidized, he was an oligarch and is one, who subsidized all these meetings. And then we have the Metropolitan, the Ukrainian Metropolitan. Here are Cossacks at the grave of Stolypin in September 2011, and they're going to figure prominently in the lecture, so keep them in mind. And then we have a Russian general, a bemetalled Russian general support, um, um, in Kiev honoring Stolypin, who of course was a Russian. It was a hopeful time in 2011. Well, we wanna get on to the, what, what is happening now and also get to the main part of the lecture, the history, the background of this. But here we have, um, we know that the war, uh, Putin's war on uh, Ukraine started the 24th of February of this year. And we have some areas here, the, um, the Donbass, Donetsk and Lugansk, these self-proclaimed independent republics that were occupied by the Russian army since 2014. And then we have some new areas, Kharkiv or Kharkiv in the, in the Ukrainian language that the Russians took 
And um, then this lower part of Ukraine with Kherson and some other cities here. These are areas that, that Putin has annexed to Russia uh, recently. And here we have another map showing the areas that Ukraine, that uh, Russia uh, took over and has annexed, although the blue uh, notes Ukrainian uh, advances, and there have been even more since um, um, this map was printed. Um, over the weekend, the past weekend, the um, bridge part was over the Kerch Strait that links southern part of, well, the northern the southern part of Russia, really, and it's also kind of near South Ukraine, with Crimea. It was damaged, and no one's really claimed um, that they have done this, but uh, the Russians believe the Ukrainians did it. So to retaliate, <clears throat> the war has recently, in the last couple of days, escalated, and the Russians have sent missiles and rockets to Ukraine uh, targeting often um, civilian areas, bombing apartments and the like, uh, the electrical grid and, and taking uh, and trying to hit even some of the nuclear plants. A couple of these in Chernobyl, which is in the north, uh, they took over early in the war. And then there's another one in the south, down in this area, uh, down in this area that they, uh, Ukrainians are manning the nuclear plant, but the Russians have it under their control. So that's very dangerous. Oops, sorry. Now, <clears throat> what are the reasons for Putin's Spets operation, which we call a war against Ukraine? Well, there's been a lot of pundits who have written about this, but some of the reasons Putin himself declared, he wrote a treatise on the fact that Ukraine is historically part of Russia and it never was a real country and it must again be united with Russia. Another <clears throat> uh, claim that he announced was that NATO was a threat and he must combat that. Then he uh, um, uh, contended that there were assaults on Russian speakers in the self-proclaimed republics of Lugansk and Donetsk. He also has claimed that Nazis uh, flourish in Ukraine, and there's a need to denazify Ukraine to carry on World War II, in other words, that the Russians uh, were involved in to eliminate these Nazis that are a major threat to Putin and Russia. And then some Possible reasons which we have surmised are logistical. It was um, uh, getting southern Ukraine would, would make an easy land connection for the Russians to the Black Sea, to Crimea, to oil and gas deposits in the Black Sea. And Ukraine also is a great agricultural area for growing wheat <clears throat> better than Russia. Let's unpack very quickly, we wanna to get to the historical part, but let's unpack these points. Uh, Ukraine being a part of Russia is going to be the gist of this lecture. But very quickly, we should say that Putin believes that he is another Peter the Great. Peter the Great did attempt to wrest the Crimea and the Azov area near the mouth of the Don River <clears throat> from the Ottoman Empire that controlled it in the early 18th century when Peter was ruling Russia. Peter also was angry that the Ukrainians did not support him in his war against Charles XII, the King of Sweden. Indeed, there was an uprising of Cossacks under their leader Mazeppa at a crucial battle in Ukraine and Poltava, uh, south of Kiev, uh, that made Peter almost lose the war. He did recover and he did uh, regain uh, control and win the war more or less by uh, 1721. But if Putin wants to be Peter, we have to remember that Peter was very, although he was brilliant and had a lot of, uh, brought a lot to Russia, a lot of scientific things and so on, he also was very cruel. He had his own son killed. 
and we'll go into more uh, uh, to refute Putin's claims that, that Ukraine was not a part of Russia or was always a part of Russia and was never an independent area. What about the NATO uh, aspect? Well, Putin may have felt threatened by the thought of NATO troops and uh, hardware in Ukraine. However, there's a very important memorandum, the Budapest Memorandum that was signed in 1994 by Russia, as well as the US and the UK. And this memorandum promised that these three signatories would respect Ukraine's sovereignty and integrity if Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons, which she did. And that is why Putin can threaten Ukraine and the world now with Russian nuclear weapons. Um, and ironically, of course, the war has brought uh, the fears of NATO has become, a, a Putin's fears have become a reality. And it has also caused uh, problems in Russia because some of the reservists called up have fled the country to Finland, Georgia, Kazakhstan, and other areas. What about the, the, um, the unfair treatment of Russian speakers in Donetsk and Lugansk, <clears throat> these self-proclaimed republics, which have had a Russian army presence since 2014? Well, we have to agree that the Ukrainian government did make a mistake of stating that the Ukrainian language would be the ling lingua franca of the country. But on the other hand, fighting that has gone on in these two republics since, since 2014 has been very detrimental, uh, much more harmful than having to speak Ukrainian in public. And we can't really get a handle on what the inhabitants of these republics feel, but there was a poll taken of the residents of Kherson uh, and Zaporizhia, I'm using the Russian spelling, two areas in the southern Ukraine that uh, have now been annexed to Russia, along with Lugansk and Donetsk. And this poll found that the residents of Kherson, less than a quarter wanted to be annexed to Russia, and less than a third of those in Zaporizhia wanted that. Uh, so we can, we can uh, counter his claim to how they want to be connected with Russia, the people there. What about the Azov Battalion? Well, there are YouTube videos which you can look at, which the viewers can look at. And there has been a documentary on this Azov Battalion. They do use Nazi symbols and pamphlets, but they're relatively minuscule amongst the 40 to 44 million Ukrainians, and they're relatively harmless. Most Ukrainians are farmers and they want peace and not, uh, they are not members of the Nazi party. Ukrainian-Russian differences have been building during the last 30 years since Ukraine uh, declared her independence in 1991. The Orange Revolution was over who would be the president, uh, whether it would be a uh, Ukrainian um, uh, Yushchenko or a Russian Yanukovych. And that was settled pretty peaceably. But the Maidan upheavals that took place in um, the uh, winter of and spring of 2014 uh, were very um, were very severe, and this occurred because Yanukovych, who was then duly elected the president, uh, rejected a, a parliamentary agreement that Ukrainians have made about their um, trade agreement with the EU. And instead, Yanukovych chose trade ties with Russia uh, because he was given a $15 billion, not ruble, dollar loan from Russia plus cheap gas. There were deaths, destruction, tearing down monuments, burning buildings, and so on. And this is when Russians went into the Crimea and took that over and then took a, a um, said that the, these Donetsk and Lugansk were um, seceding from Ukraine and, and they would have a Russian military presence. But conflicts occurred much earlier. And before we get into the main lecture, as we go through that lecture, I want to have you think about some 
uh, general points. First of all, there was no Russia and no Ukraine until the 15th century, which would refute Putin's allegation uh, that <clears throat> Ukraine was always a part of Russia. The areas we call Russia and Ukraine were comprised of principalities and city-states from the 10th century. And very important, they were separated in the mid 13th century. And their religions, languages, culture, law, and political institutions developed differently. When these areas were recombined in the 17th and 18th century, they were very different from each other. And so that's very important. Both Ukraine and Russia were part of the Russian empire. And although we call it the Russian empire, actually there were a hundred ethnic groups and languages in the area of the Russian empire. And these same peoples were also part of the Soviet empire. The Russians dominated the Tsarist and Soviet empires politically and culturally, but the, both empires were multi-ethnic, multi-religious, and multilinguistic. Another problem was that the people in both empires were mixed. That is, they intermarried Russians with Kazakhs, or for instance, Russians with Ukrainians. Uh, they were neighbors and they lived um, they moved into each other's territories, as we will see. And so the problem arose when the Russian Empire disintegrated in 1918, and more so when the Soviet Empire uh, imploded in 1991. But having said that, the 20th century has been a period when many empires fell apart. The British Empire, uh, the German Empire, Austro-Hungarian Empire, the French Empire, the Dutch Empire, and new countries and nation states emerged and were duly acknowledged by the international community. So Putin cannot hold this uh, um, against Ukraine. The viability of the new nation states in the 20th century has been based upon size, economic and political formation, language, the will of the people inhabiting the area and international recognition. And this has been given to Ukraine. Finally, Ukrainians have had strong grievances against the Tsarist empire, against Tsarist Russia in the Tsarist and, and particularly against the Soviet Russia. So now we're going to look at the history of why Ukrainians feel different and wish to be independent. Maps are important. And this is a modern map of the Kievan Rus period, the period, the historical period from the ninth to the 13th century, the beginning of uh, the history of Ukraine and Russia, though they weren't called that at this time. The areas that we call Ukraine and Russia were a conglomerate of nine principalities and three city-states. And the princes who ruled the area, the, the basic people were Slavic and they, they had come in, in the nine, by the sixth century. But the um, princes who ruled them were Vikings primarily from Sweden. And they had come in not to rule the Slavs in Russia, but to conquer Constantinople. They weren't able to do so, so they settled down in Russia, intermarried with the Slavic people and so on. Kiev was called the mother of the Rus lands. That is true, Putin's right, he did read history. But very important was Lord Novgorod the Great, this area up at the, at the top of our map here. It was like a mini empire and it was very, very wealthy, and it was huge, as we can see. Um, here's another map of Kievan Rus in the uh, 9th to mid 13th century, and we see some of these lands. Here's the Kievan land, here's Bol Bolinia and Galicia, which uh, are in the west. Chernigov is very important um, area, and then uh, 
so these are the kind of areas that became um, what we know of as Ukraine and then Belarus up here, Polotsk and Smolensk. Um, and then we have the areas that would later become Russia, Vladimir Suzdo and uh, Ryazan actually, Vyatka and Lord Novgorod the Great up here. And, but other peoples lived there as well. There were a lot of Turkic peoples and still are in this area. Uh, Hazars, they lived down, down here in the Caucasus. Their leaders became Jewish and they fought Arabs, I might say, in the eighth and ninth centuries because the Arabs were moving up to, uh, into this area. The Bulgars, uh, the Pechenegs, the Polovtsi, the Kumans who went to Romania, a lot of these groups were in the southern, what we would call now Ukraine in the steppes, north of the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. And some of them stayed there and some of them moved west. They moved into Bulgaria, Romania. The Magyars were horsemen who moved into Hungary in the ninth century. Uh, so there, we need to think about them as well. Uh, and here's another kind of a sketchy map, but um, the, these uh, principalities uh, traded with other peoples in, in Eastern and Western Europe, and they traded with China and people in the Middle East. We can't go into that, it was very interesting. And Novgorod, who was very important, was part of the Hanseatic League of German cities in um, the latter part of this period. Now there were common elements uh, amongst the uh, principalities and city-states. They had a common, at least the leaders did, a common religion. Uh, this is a, a statue of St. Vladimir looking over the Dnieper River. And he became a Christian under the auspices of the Byzantine Empire, an Orthodox Christian in 988 in order to marry the sister of the Byzantine emperor. But I think he also had an interior conversion. At this time and with this conversion, the uh, Viking Slavic Rus got their alphabet. It was the, what we call the Cyrillic alphabet. It was developed by two saints, Cyril and Methodius, not for the Rus, but for the Bulgars, uh, the Turkic Slavic people in Bulgaria who had become Christian in the ninth century earlier on. The literary language of this Kievan Rus period was Old Church Slavonic. The architecture, art, and musical instruments in Kievan Rus were highly influenced by Byzantium, but Russian law was more Viking. The blood vengeance, which is a hallmark of, if you've read the um, sagas, the um, Scandinavian sagas, they're always killing everyone uh, that they disagree with. Blood vengeance was a part of the law of Kiev and Rus. And then in the late 11th century, it was replaced by money fines for all crimes. Here's just a little um, example of the writing of the period. This was from the, um, this is from Novgorod and they wrote on birch bark and wood. And they wrote these telegraphic business um, uh, letters, I guess you could say, or communications. Uh, Novgorod was a business-like empire and it was not ruled by princes. It was ruled by the burghers, the business people of Novgorod. And at one point there was a woman ruler of Novgorod actually. So it was a very interesting area. Now here's the important, the crucial point of the lecture. The principalities that formed what we call Ukraine and Belarus today over here on the left, um, Kiev, um, Chernigov, uh, and some other of these, uh, um, Galicia, Volhynia. These went under the domination of Lithuania and then Poland in the 13th and 14th centuries, starting in the 13th century. Kiev was briefly conquered by the Mongols, but three years later it was under the power of Lithuania, the Lithuanian princes. Meanwhile, the area that became Russia, there was no Moscow. Uh, Moscow was a little village in the 12th century. 
but the areas that um, Moscow developed in Vladimir Suzdal. And um, so these areas became part of the Mongol Empire in the 13th century. The Mongols came up through the Caucasus and they did not live up in Russia, but they demanded uh, taxes from the people living in these northern principalities, including Novgorod, the city-state, and they conscripted their men for the Mongol army. So the two areas become separated. And that's very, very important because they developed differently. The areas where now you see Moscow, er, uh, Moscow became a powerful um, principality uh, in, in the 14th, 15th, 16th centuries. Um, it was well located on river systems. It was uh, protected by other principalities when the Mongols came up to, to, um, to ravage the area because they weren't getting their money or getting the conscripts. It was protected by Riazan, as you can see here. And in addition to this favorable um, uh, uh, economic and, and uh, air, uh, location, which attracted a lot of people, the population increased. But very important were the capable Muscovite princes, and they were ruthless. They were capable and ruthless. And what they did, one of them in particular, starting with one, Ivan III in the 15th, early 16th century, they started suppressing these other principalities that were autonomous and independent up until that time. And Ivan suppressed very harshly Novgorod, this very rich mini empire. He took it over in 1478. He bought some of the principalities, he arranged marriages to get them, and he had wars against the other principalities. And what he did was transfer people out of the conquered principalities and put people from the Muscovite area in there to neutralize opposition. He formed a sophisticated civil service and he stopped paying tribute to the Mongols at the end of his reign. And very crucial was the, was the ethos that he created with his second marriage after Maria of Tiber died, the first wife, his second marriage to Zoe Paleologa, who was the niece of the last Byzantine emperor. She had been raised in Rome when uh, the Byzantine Empire fell to the Ottoman Turks in 1453. And he married her and that gave him entree to the double-headed eagle, which became the hallmark of Russia, uh, as well as Austria, I might say, <clears throat> but that's a sidebar. And the title of Tsar, which was a contraction of Caesar. And it also made the Russian, or rather the Muscovite princes, protectors of the Orthodox Christian churches, because they were all after the 15th century, they were under the domination of the Ottoman Turks. So that was very important. Meanwhile, uh, what was happening in the areas of the principalities that came under Lithuania and Poland, what was happening there? Completely different experience. Eastern Rus is top down, Muscovy, top down, but, and Orthodox, very Orthodox. But in the areas of the, um, the principalities, Galenia, Galicia, you see them here, and Kiev and Chernigov that came under Lithuania, Poland, we have the influence of Catholicism because Poland uh, was Catholic and the Lithuanians became Catholic when their prince married, wanted to marry Hedwiga, the daughter of the king of Poland. Up until that time, they were not, they were pagans. Um, Protestantism also had influence uh, there. Latin was the language of the church, but it also was used in education and science down through the 18th century. So that was important for the upper classes that were in the area. Law. The towns received the Magdeburg law, which gave them autonomy. It was a German law. And they also got the Lithuanian statute, which replaced customary property law by statutory or written law. So things are, 
getting regulated there. The nobles became very important and they were exporting grain. The positions of the peasants deteriorated. Interestingly, we have serfdom in this area earlier than in Russia. There was no serfdom in Russia until the middle of the 17th century, 1649, it starts. The Russians had slavery earlier, but not serfdom, which is a, a, an interesting point we can't go into. Education, Casimir the Great, established a university in Krakow, which became known as Jagiellonian University. The Jesuit colleges were established to combat Protestantism. The Jewish component increased in Poland and Lithuania and would be in Western Ukraine and Belarus because Casimir, who was the ruler in the middle of the 14th century in, in Poland, invited Jews who were kicked out of Spain to come to his principality. And, and he welcomed their, um, their expertise in many areas. And we also have the rise of the Cossacks who are gonna be very important in the 15th century. Their first camp was established in the islands south of Kiev and there would be 11 Cossack hosts and they're going to be very important. Why? because they were armed and they were horsemen and they fought different rulers, the Ottomans, the Poles and the Russians uh, because they were, they were a formidable force. They were very, very important. And they will be the hall bearers of the Ukrainian nationalism. And we'll see that in just a minute. So science was more developed in the area that would influence the Ukrainian elites. Uh, we have Copernicus who was at this Jagiellonian University and the elites in the U principalities, Ukrainian quote unquote principalities that were under Lithuania, Poland, also went to study at other Italian universities and so on. Uh, and the Ukrainian language was influenced by Polish by the Roman alphabet and other languages used in Poland. The election of the top leaders was different in the principalities that came under Lithuania, Poland, because from the late 16th century, the Polish kings were elected and they were rather weak in comparison to the nobles. Whereas in Muscovy, East Rus, we have already said that the rulers of Muscovy, the Muscovite princes were very strong, conquered other principalities, conquered Novgorod, and they were very, very harsh. It is true that the Romanovs were elected by a council of the land in the early 17th century when the older dynasty had died out, but they founded a dynasty that lasted till 1913. In, in Muscovy and in Russia, it was top down rule. Uh, whereas in the Ukrainian areas, the nobles were very strong and countered the top ruler. Now, these differences were there and they come to the fore when Muscovy gets back the, what we call left bank Ukraine, left uh, of the um, Dnieper River where Kiev is, it flows down to the um, Black Sea. So we, we call the Eastern part of Ukraine um, uh, right bank or rather left bank Ukraine, Eastern Ukraine. And this occurred in the middle of the 17th century when um, a Cossack and a, a well-educated individual, uh, fluent in Polish and Latin, uh, graduate of Jesuit college, Bogdan Milnitsky had a grievance against the Poles and he galvanized the Cossacks to revolt against Poland, which had these uh, which had these uh, provinces, these, these principalities under their rule. The Cossacks couldn't do it on their own, so they asked for Muscovite help. And Moscow fought two wars with Poland, and they got back the eastern part of Ukraine up to the Dnieper River, including Kiev. The right bank Ukraine, the western part of Ukraine, was attached to now the Russian Empire. Peter the Great established the Russian Empire, so it wasn't called Muscovy anymore. And this occurred during the, ruin, uh, during the reign, pardon me, of Catherine the Great. 
Um, and so she acquired through the partitions of Lithuania, Poland, there were three, with Prussia and Austria, she acquired uh, the western part of these um, these areas, the western part, and, um, and she also took over the Crimea. Um, so almost immediately after this, we have the beginning of Ukrainian nationalism. It didn't start recently. It started in the late 18th century. And we already talked about the Cossacks against Peter. Uh, intellectuals, Ukrainian intellectuals, uh, wrote chronicles about Little Russia, as Ukraine was called at that time, and how different they were. Kharkiv University, founded in the early 19th century, was a hotbed of Ukrainian nationalism. Um, and this went on in the 19th century. Uh, people wrote about the differences in language, the Ukrainian language, Ukrainian dictionary. Very important was Taras Shevchenko, uh, who, was, who was a poet and an artist, and he used Ukrainian in his poetry, showing that that language was not just a dialect, but could be used in high culture. Gogol was also a Ukrainian who owned serfs, I might add, but he identified with St. Petersburg in Russia and not with Ukraine. And uh, there was also this brotherhood of Cyril and Methodius that was striving for an independent Ukraine. Well, what did the Tsarist government do in reaction to this? Well, they were very upset, needless to say. Shevchenko was harshly punished. He was sent to Siberia and, and was died a broken man. The Society of Cyril and Methodius was liquidated. The use of the Ukrainian language, which the Russians considered a dialect was banned publicly in schools and the media until 1906. And so Ukrainian nationalism moves to Lviv or Lvov, the little corner of Ukraine that was in the Austrian empire following these partitions. Um, and because the Austrians were more conciliatory to their national minorities. Well, some other important things happened in the latter or second half of the 19th century. The sugar beet uh, industry was very important in Western Ukraine, export of Ukrainian wheat, um, and the industrialization of the Donbass. And a, um, a guy from a Welshman actually started the first um, uh, coal mining industry and uh, iron industry in the Donbass. And this led to an influx of Russians from the North, including Nikita Khrushchev's family. And so this strengthened the Russian speakers in Eastern Ukraine. Most of the Ukrainians remained peasants at the time. Um, the Ukrainian intelligentsia kept pushing for uh, Ukrainian autonomy, even independence. A leader was Khrushchevsky, a historian. And the moment came in 1917 with the collapse of the Tsarist empire and the arrest of Nicholas and his family. Uh, and uh, then with the Bolshevik revolution of October, November, Ukrainian intellectuals proclaimed independence. A civil war followed, which was very chaotic. We can't go into that, we don't have time. But what happened was that Ukraine was independent for a year, the last year of World War I, when the Germans occupied Ukraine and Skoropadsky, a Cossack leader, uh, ruled Ukraine and another Cossack followed him. But this Ukrainian independence was harshly suppressed by the centralist Bolsheviks. They insisted that Moscow would run the areas and they won the civil war and they, they conquered Ukraine. They also conquered Georgia and, um, and they insisted that they would be the leaders. Poland also got a little bit of Ukrainian territory through a war with uh, Soviet Russia in the early twenties. Now, so Ukrainians hated, they began, it, now the, the Ukrainian idea of nationalism filtered down to the people, the peasants, 
and their antagonism toward Moscow was increased by Bolshevik policies. The Bolsheviks nationalized businesses, but they also uh, requisitioned grain from the peasants. That helped them win the Civil War. They let up a little in the early 1920s, but then they came right back and crushed private businesses in the mid 1920s. And also in the late 1920s, we have in the early 30s, collectivization of agriculture. The peasants were forced onto large collective farms that were devoid of needed equipment. And they also killed their animals. They, they were supposed to collectivize their animals and they, they killed them rather than do this and they burned their crops. In retaliation, the uh, Soviets um, sent a, a million and a half uh, Ukrainians to hard labor in Siberia. The Soviet constitutions of 1924 and 1936 allowed the major Soviet republics like Ukraine to secede from, from the Soviet Union, but this was only a paper right. And then there were also purges. Khrushchevsky, who had led the uh, movement for Ukrainian independence, the, the historian, well, he was executed in the 1920s. Then we have the famine of 1932-33, which killed millions in Ukraine. We're not sure of how many. And also in North Caucasus and parts of Russia, actually, because although bad weather contributed and the peasants killing their animals contributed, um, re government requisition, Stalin's requisition of peasant crops for export um, uh, 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 affected this, this famine. There were more purges. And then in 1939, in his pact with Hitler, Stalin got Western Belarus and Western Ukraine that had gone to Poland um, after it had gone to Austria. And a lot of these people were sent to the Gulag. In World War II, the Ukrainians gave as well as they had been given to the Russians. They welcomed invading Germans. There were pogroms against Jews, which we can't go into, which was terrible because one of the reasons they claimed was they considered Jews supporters of the Bolsheviks, the communists. But this does not justify the atrocities. But Ukrainians suffered also. After, at the end of the war, Stalin considered their collaboration treason, which it was, and he sent many Ukrainians, Baltic peoples, they had acquired the Baltic states in 1940, Poles, Crimean Tatars, and Caucasian people to hard labor in the Gulag, and many died there, and they died en route to their hard labor. So that was tragic. And the United States and the UK returned a lot of these <clears throat> Soviet citizens who didn't want to go back, uh, who were in Austria. Uh, and they, they sent, there were, there's a, a little rock there in Judenburg uh, about the 28,000 Cossacks who killed themselves by jumping into the Moor River rather than go back to Soviet Russia. Nationalism was on the rise in the Soviet Union in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. It was at this time that Khrushchev, whose family had worked in eastern Ukraine, and he felt some kind of connection to Ukrainians, he gave Crimea to Ukraine in 1954. And this is a bone of contention, of course, with um, Putin. Um, and I was there in, at the end of Khrushchev's administration, and people told me they were very dissatisfied with living conditions, political restrictions, and people wanted, uh, the national minorities wanted independence. Plans for independence on the part of the national minorities uh, gained during the uh, administration of party secretary Mikhail Gorbachev, and the opportunity came with the implosion of the Soviet Union in 1991. So this has been a race, but I hope it's been informative and you can read more about this and so on. Conclusions. Ukrainian nationalism is not new. Some of the pundits blame the United States and NATO and said that if we didn't, if we weren't there and threatening to bring NATO to Ukraine, that 
caused Putin to uh, invade. No, that's ridiculous. Um, the arguments between Ukraine and Russia are old and, um, and, uh, and Putin has stipulated his reasons, which were more than just NATO. Um, but Ukrainian nationalism is not new. Ukrainian history and historical development is different from that which occurred in uh, the North in Moscow. Ukrainians had many grievances against Moscow, which fuels their desire to be independent. And they can be uh, because they have enough population, they have viable agriculture and industry, and they have been legally recognized by the concert of nations as a sovereign nation. Uh, Putin is acting like earlier rulers who started wars uh, for their own benefit. He's ignoring Ukraine's sovereign status. He's ignoring the Budapest Memorandum, which he personally did not sign, but which his country did. I do agree that making Putin a pariah by some American and European administrations was not sensible, it was stupid really. Putin's desire to make Russia a great power as it was during the Cold War is understandable. His threat of using nuclear weapons is a, a, a concern. But to finally conclude, no matter how Putin feels, he cannot invade and destroy a sovereign nation. His stated reasons are spurious and um, there is now dissatisfaction amongst even some Russian generals and certainly on the part of a large portion of the Russian public, not just the conscripts against this war, which is not a spets operation, it's a war and a very destructive one. And um, we can see that on YouTube and so on, it's been in all the news. Even China is cool to Putin's war. Turkey, Erdogan would like to arbitrate. And so to conclude finally, Western states need to force Putin to cease military operations, in my opinion, if they can, and to pay for the rebuilding of what he has destroyed. Thank you very much uh, for, for listening to this and looking at this. And I, again, I'm honored that the Rock, Rocky Mountain Map Society asked me to present this lecture. Thank you, Naomi. Thank you, Angel. And thank you to the Rocky Mountain Art Society. Thank you so much, Mary, uh, for this uh, brilliant talk that has really enlightened us to at least understand the, the background behind these disputes between Ukraine and Russia and how they are different. We may not understand uh, the outcome of this or what's going to happen, That's but at least we know how we got into this, uh, into this mess. And uh, so we really appreciate that. And, and we wish you all the best on your efforts to, to educate the public on, on this, which is so important and so confusing when you just look at the news. So- Thank you uh, both. And thank you, Naomi. Thank you both. I, I was honored to present this. Oh. I hope it helps people to understand. Oh but yeah, it was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. All the um, best. I have one question before you sign off. Uh -huh. um, since the audience watching this recording uh, won't be able to ask you questions like you had so many of when you did the live talk. Oh, they were a wonderful audience. The live audience was great. <laughs> they had a lot of interaction. I'm just wondering if you would be willing to entertain questions if people would email you, for example. Of course. Okay. So when we post this talk, um, when I put out the newsletter, I'll also put your email for people if they would like to contact you. Right, and you've got my email, maryesconroy at gmail.com. I'd be happy. I would be gratified because I can only hope that soon the end will come. I keep thinking that I won't be giving this lecture because it's gonna be all over. It's gonna be in the past and that would be great. But I'll be happy to, of course, to interact with anyone who wishes to write a question. Thank you. All right, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you so much, Mary, and for everybody. We'll that, be done, uh, yeah. <laughs> I thank know. you in, in Russian. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. For everybody that is watching, um, well, we hope to see you in uh, future uh, lectures of the Rocky Mountain Map Society.